Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you. Welcome home to Trinity. Today is a very special day, the day we're going to be uh, installing our two new teachers, uh, uh, Dane Kupfer <coughs> and Lori Halitsky. Uh, we uh, thank God for them and wish them God's blessings today. In our service today, we are continuing our sermon series based on the book of Proverbs. Um, and the wisdom that Solomon has to share with us today is spare the rod and spoil the child. The order of service that we're following is Divine Service 2, so it's printed out for you in your service folder. and will also be available on the screen if you'd like to follow along there. We begin our, with our first hymn then, hymn 181, Come, O Come, Life-Giving Spirit. We follow the order of service as it's printed in your service folder. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins 
asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God has made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that we may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask. Accept through the merits and mediation of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson is recorded in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, beginning at verse 3. 
Elijah was discouraged and afraid as he ran for his life. In his mercy, the Lord provided food and water for Elijah and strength for the long journey. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. He went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. There he sat down under a broom tree where he prayed that he would die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then he lay down and went to sleep under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. Then he looked around, and near his head there was a loaf of bread baking on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and then he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, because the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Then with the strength gained from that food, he walked for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Here ends our first scripture lesson. The psalm of the day is Psalm 34. We'll sing it together after our organist introduces it. Our epistle lesson is recorded in Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 30. Rather than grieving the Holy Spirit, here the Apostle Paul urges us to be imitators of God, to be kind and compassionate and forgiving toward others just as he has been toward us. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of every kind of bitterness, rage, anger, quarreling, and slander, along with every kind of malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as his dearly loved children, and walk in love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Alleluia.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. The Jewish people had trouble believing that Jesus really was the Son of God, the bread that had come down from heaven. In these verses, though, Jesus assures us that he is. And he assures us that all who feed on him, who believe in him, have eternal life. So the Jews started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They asked, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? So how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. I am not saying that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He is the one who has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I tell you. The one who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated and we'll continue with our next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is recorded in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, and also chapter 13, verse 24. We'll be looking at these verses during the course of the sermon. In the name of Jesus Christ, our gracious and faithful shepherd, and fellow children of God. Back in the 1950s, a psychologist and a psychiatrist set out to prove a point that crime is caused by environment. So they began a 17-year study. The study involved in countless hours of clinical testing on 250 inmates in Washington, D.C. To their astonishment, they discovered that the cause of crime could not be traced to environment or poverty or even oppression. Instead, they discovered that people often do wrong things because, in their words, they made bad moral choices. In their 1977 work, The Criminal Personality, they concluded that the answer to the crime is a conversion of the wrongdoer to a more responsible lifestyle. 1987, two Harvard professors reached similar conclusions. They also did a prolonged study, and in their book, Crime and Human Nature, they determined that the cause of crime can be traced to a lack of moral training among young people, especially during their formative years, ages one through six. Now, it might be a little bit surprising that these researchers independently came to the same conclusions, but it, it really shouldn't surprise us, right? After all, these researchers could have saved themselves a lot of time and probably our government a lot of money if they just had opened their Bibles. The Bible clearly teaches that People are born sinful. We call that original sin or inherited sin. The Bible also teaches that it's very, very important for parents to train their children. Let me share with you a, a couple of different verses from the book of Proverbs. First from chapter 19, Solomon says, Discipline your son, for in that there is hope. And then from chapter 22, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Did you catch the word that is used in both of those passages? Discipline? Discipline often carries a negative connotation. We tend to associate it with, with pain and punishment. So most of us would agree that being disciplined isn't much fun. The Bible actually says the same. In the book of Hebrews, it says this. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. However, it goes on to say that it produces some long-term benefits. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. No, we may not enjoy it. We may not ever look forward to discipline, but... With God's help, we can learn to appreciate it. For as Solomon warns us in the book of Proverbs, spare the rod and spoil the child. Now, it would be easy, of course, to make this entire sermon about Christian parenting, and there certainly wouldn't be anything wrong with that. But before we talk about parenting, how parents should or perhaps should not discipline their children, it's important for us to understand discipline and how it's used here in Proverbs. That word discipline occurs already in the very first chapter. There in the opening verses, Solomon says that the Proverbs were written for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. Proverbs is more than just a how-to manual for moms and dads. Proverbs is a book for all believers it has something for everyone, for young and old, for parents and children, for you and me. 
Even if you're single, even if you don't have any children, you still can benefit from the lesson Solomon has to teach us today because God uses that parent-child relationship to illustrate and describe his personal relationship with you. Solomon writes, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Can there be any doubt that God loves you? If you do happen to have any doubts, all you have to do is look at the cross, where Jesus, the Son of God, gave his life for your sins and the sins of the world. As the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Can you imagine the family of Anaya Allen, that six-year-old girl from Minneapolis who was shot back in May while eating McDonald's in the back seat of a car? Can you imagine her family having one of their other children or maybe one of their relatives go to prison so that her shooter might go free? I can't. Or can you imagine... President Biden allowing his son to go to prison so that someone like Joaquin Guzman, the notorious Mexican drug lord, might be set free from prison? I can't. And yet that is what God has done for us. In love, he gave up his son for us. He had him suffer and die for our sins, so that we might not perish, but might live forever with him in heaven. And that isn't all he has done. God has demonstrated his love for you in so many other ways as well. He provides for you and protects you. He gives us all food to eat and clothes to wear and cars to drive and campers to go camping and TVs to watch. And if that wasn't enough to convince you that you are one of his dearly loved children, Solomon adds one more piece of evidence to the list. God demonstrates his love for you every time he disciplines you. You heard that right. Discipline is evidence of God's love for you. Now, if that doesn't sound quite right, maybe an illustration would help. As many of you know, I grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota. One time... When I was five or six years old, old enough to know better, I played with matches in the pig barn. You see, I had found a, a book of matches in my grandpa's car, and one night when I was supposed to be doing my chores, I, I took out the book of matches and started playing with them. I lit them one at a time, and I, I used them to burn the ends of the stalks that were sticking out of the, out of the straw bales. The next day, my dad found the burnt match sticks and noticed the burnt ends of the stalks of the straw bales and he came to question my brothers and me. When he found out what I had done, he walloped me a good one. Hard enough that I had it up on the ground. His face was red. His voice was raised and he made it clear in no uncertain terms, you do not play with matches ever, especially in the pig barn. Now, if I didn't get hurt and nothing else bad had happened, why did my dad discipline me so severely? Because he loved me. I could easily have burned down the pig barn that night. I very easily could have killed all of our pigs, and worst of all, I could have killed myself. Dad wanted to put the fear of God in me so that I would never, ever want to do such a, a foolish and dangerous thing again. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us the same way. In fact, He loves us even more than our parents. But sometimes, like children, we make mistakes. We make bad decisions. We foolishly ignore Him and His Word because we think that we, uh, we know better. We rebel against Him and, and we sin against Him. And what does our Heavenly Father do? What does God do when we foolishly ignore His Word and disobey Him? 
put ourselves in spiritual danger. What does he do? Does he just ignore it? No. He loves us too much to do that. Instead, in love, he, he, he disciplines us. Now, let's get one thing straight. God does not punish us for our sins. If he did, if God did punish us for our sins, well, then we would end up in hell because that's the punishment our sins deserve. But because of his great love for us, God punished his son Jesus instead. He punished Jesus for our sinful words and actions. He punished Jesus for our foolishly ignoring him and his will. He punished Jesus for our, our disobedience and our insolence at times. He punished Jesus so that we might be spared, so that we might be forgiven. And yet, because he loves us, he does discipline us at times. He allows trouble to come into our lives. He allows us to experience headaches and heartaches to lead us to repentance, to turn away from our sins and back to him. There is another word in English that's related to the word discipline. It's the word disciple. That's what you and I are, right? Disciples of Jesus. Students who are, are constantly learning more about God and his will and his ways. As we experience the Lord's discipline in our lives, we, we do learn more about God. We learn to respect him as a righteous God. We learn to appreciate that he's a forgiving God. We learn to trust that his way is the best way. And yes, we even learn to appreciate his discipline. So far, we've been talking about discipline from the perspective of the one being disciplined. For many of us, though, especially those of us who are parents, we, we know what it's like to be on the other side. Disciplining children is not very easy, but it is important. So important that Solomon had this to say about it in Proverbs chapter 13. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. The wisdom of Solomon certainly goes against conventional wisdom nowadays. Corporal punishment is not just old-fashioned anymore. Many people would like to make it illegal. In fact, there are some state legislatures that have even considered legislation to make it illegal for parents to spank their own children. Now, before we start taking sides on the issue, before we decide that the government is overstepping its bounds or that corporal punishment is just another name for child abuse, we need to take a step back and remind ourselves what God says to parents. God commands parents to take care of their children, to protect them, to provide for their daily needs. God also directs parents to provide for their children's spiritual needs, to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. God tells parents what to do, but he doesn't tell them how to do it. The Bible lays out the principles, but it doesn't get into the specific details. So parenting, even among Christian parents, can differ. One couple may decide that they're not going to use a, a paddle or the bare hand in discipline. That's fine. That doesn't mean they, they hate their children. In another family, spanking may be considered an appropriate form of discipline. That's fine, too. That doesn't mean they hate their children either. Sometimes this passage is cited to support corporal punishment. And that's not an abuse of Solomon's words here, but it does miss the main point. Solomon is not arguing here that you really don't love your children unless you use a rod to discipline them. And what he's doing is emphasizing the importance of discipline. So if you 
care not to use a rod or your hand in disciplining your children? That's fine. That's not the issue. The issue is what are you going to do to discipline them? What are you going to do, for example, when you tell them no and they do it anyway? What are you going to do when you tell them that they can't have cookies and ice cream before supper and they throw a fit? What are you going to do when you tell them to clean up their room or pick up their toys and they say, I don't want to? What are you going to do? You see, that's so often the problem. Instead of disciplining their children for their disobedience or their defiance, children or parents give in and do nothing. What Solomon is saying to parents is this. If you love your children, you won't let them say whatever they want. If you love your children, you won't let them do whatever they want. If you love your children, there will be rules for them to follow. And if they break those rules, there will be consequences. Now, granted, as you do that as a parent, that's not going to make you Mr. or Mrs. Popular. There are going to be many times when your children don't like you one bit because you grounded them or took away their cell phone or told them that they couldn't watch TV or play video games. Some days, you're going to feel kind of tired and worn out, and your patience is going to wear thin. But with God's help, you can hang in there and be the parent. With his help, you won't give up on your children, and, and you won't give in to them either, because you love them. And one day, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, when they're grown and they have children of their own, one day, they'll appreciate what you did. You can't take it with you. I'm sure you're familiar with that phrase. And it's true when it comes to the things of this life. You can't take your car with you when you die. You can't take your, your fishing boat or your motorcycle. You can't take your cell phone or, or your iPad. You, you can't take anything with you to heaven except your children. Christian parents teach their children about Jesus and his word and his will so that they will look to him and trust in him as their savior. Christian parents teach their children the ways of the Lord, the way they should go so that when they are old, they, they, they won't turn away from it. Christian parents do the difficult job of disciplining their children because more than anything else in the world, they want to see their children in heaven. Christian parents take Solomon's words of wisdom on discipline to heart. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our Christian faith together. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. One of the ways that we express our gratitude and thanks to our Lord for his many blessings is through the offerings that we give. Uh, we will not be passing the offering plates. Uh, they're available in the back. You can catch them on the way out if you miss them on your way in. Uh, during the offering time, we do ask you to uh, sign the friendship register. Those are available along the center aisle. Please uh, take them and then sign them and then pass them to the other people in the aisle so they can sign as well. At this time, I invite our teachers to come forward, uh, Dane and Lori, um, as we install them as teachers here at Trinity. So you can come up, up to this row here. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said to his church, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. A Christian school is one of the ways we carry out the Lord's command as we let children come to him and do not hinder them, but rather nurture them with the life-giving word of God. We do this trusting God's promise. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Dear brother and sister in Christ, Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church has called you to serve as teachers. You have been prepared for this ministry by careful instruction in the word of God so that you carry out your duties in conformity with that word. As an ambassador of Christ, you are to teach the pure doctrine of God's word to instruct the young in the way of salvation, and always, and always to have in your heart the spiritual welfare of every soul under your care. You are to devote yourself to the meditation and study of the scriptures. You are to be an example to others in godliness and Christian living, putting no stumbling block in anyone's path so that the ministry will not be discredited. You are to speak the truth in love. As the Apostle Peter reminds us, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The ability to carry out this calling is not in us, but it comes alone from God. As St. Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. The Holy Spirit, who himself has called you to this ministry, he will be with you. Now, in keeping with the word and the will of the Lord, you are about to be installed as teachers at Trinity. I ask you in the presence of God and this congregation, are you fully determined to carry out this work according to the grace which God will give? If so, answer, I am. Do you believe that the canonical books of the Old and New Testament are the inspired word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? If so, answer, I do. Do you accept the three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian, as faithful testimonies to the truth of the Holy Scriptures? And do you reject all the errors which they condemn? If so, answer, I do. Do you solemnly promise that all your teachings will conform to the Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran confessions? If so, answer, I do. Will you give faithful witness to Christ in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do and say? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. The Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Now I address the congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have heard the solemn promise given by these teachers you have called. I urge you, therefore, to receive them with joy and to keep in mind always that the word, what the word of God expects of you as members of this congregation. Working together with them, for our Lord's kingdom, so that by your works of service, the body of Christ might be built up. To help them by your word and example in teaching the young, remembering how the scriptures urge you to bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. And to pray for them continually, that their ministry among you may be greatly blessed, and that they may have a cheerful spirit in all their duties. Provide also for their physical needs. For the Lord says, the worker, is, the worker deserves his wages. Honor and love them. As the Apostle Paul urges, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Now I ask you in the presence of God, are you willing to receive them as, a servant, as servants of Christ? Will you show them love, honor, and support them with your gifts? If so, Trinity, I ask, if so, answer. We will and we ask God to help us. The almighty and merciful God, strengthen and assist you always. Now can you kneel? Dane Coffert. I install you as a teacher at Trinity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord pour out on you his Holy Spirit for the work he has commissioned to do, that you may faithfully proclaim the gospel. Amen. Lori Holitsky, I install you as a teacher at Trinity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord pour out on you his Holy Spirit for the work committed to you, that you may faithfully proclaim the gospel. Amen. You may stand. And let us pray. Gracious and most merciful Lord, we thank you for providing faithful teachers to your church to proclaim your holy gospel among us. Grant your blessing on Dane and Lori. By that by their efforts, your lambs may be fed 
and your people strengthened and sustained in saving faith. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Now go then, take up the work to which you have been called. The Lord bless you and make you a blessing to many, that you may bear fruit and that your fruit may remain to eternal life. Amen. You may go and have a seat. Then I ask that the congregation please stand for prayer. Almighty and merciful Father, we confess to you our many sins, that we have often been disobedient and stubborn and rebellious. In your mercy, forgive our many sins for Jesus' sake. Cover us in the robe of righteousness, which he earned for us by his suffering and death on the cross. And through your word and sacrament, Strengthen our faith and renew our hearts that we may live as your children and bring glory and honor and thanks to you. In your mercy, bless your church, your family of believers. May our pastors and teachers always teach and preach the truth of your word. And let your people gladly hear it and believe it. Stir up your people with your Holy Spirit, turning their hearts to faithful worship and their lives to loving service. In your mercy, bless our families as well. May Christ dwell richly in the hearts of both parents and children, that our homes may stand as models of godliness to an ungodly world. Help parents in raising their children. Bless their efforts, especially in bringing them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, that they may always look to you as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask your comfort on behalf of the family and friends of Greg Manthe, who was called home to heaven this past week, and on behalf of the family and friends of Mary Ernst, who was called home to heaven very suddenly yesterday. Together with them, we thank you for the grace and many blessings you gave them during their lifetimes, especially for bringing them to faith in Jesus as their Savior and making them your dearly loved children. Comfort their family and friends with your love and peace and with the sure hope that they will see him again one day in glory with you. We also ask your blessing, Father, on Levon Schlingman as she will be undergoing surgery this week. Bless the work of the doctors and nurses that her surgery might be successful and her health restored. Hear us, Father, and grant our requests for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen. We continue with the communion liturgy on page 6 of your service folder. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right to go to you. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and at all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who called us to be his own so that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true Christian faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, and said, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Please stand and we'll sing the song of Simeon. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Good morning once again and welcome to all of you. A few reminders, so in our prayers this morning, we mentioned that uh, Greg Manthe, one of our members, was called home to heaven this last week. So the funeral for him is going to be this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock with visitation one hour beforehand at 10 o'clock. I put out uh, uh, several resources from our lending library. We have a, a lending library here at church with lots of resources for parenting and, and devotions, uh, family devotions, things like that. So those are on the table there in back. Uh, you're welcome to check them out. Um, and if you would like to take one home with you, you do need to check it out. So uh, uh, don't just walk off with it. Uh, just uh, see me after the service, and we'll be sure you get it checked out from the library. And then as noted in the bulletin, um, we do have a voters meeting coming up uh, two weeks from today on August 29th at 1015. So last but certainly not least, we welcome uh, Dane and, and Lori. Uh, glad that your families could be with us today. We wish you God's blessings. So we're going to be having a, a brunch of kind, uh, some uh, kinds that's served uh, right after the service. Uh, so we're going to um, have them go first, their families go first, just go uh, right into the serving line, and you can lead the rest of us uh, uh, to the goodies. So uh, we're going to um, say a prayer for those who are staying uh, for the brunch, and then uh, we'll have you guys go first, and the rest of us will just follow. So we pray. Oh, Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, the many gifts that you give us each and every day, especially the gifts of forgiveness and salvation in Jesus, our Savior. We thank you not only for providing for all that we need for our souls, but for our bodies as well. Uh, we give you thanks and praise as we say, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Okay, Lori and Dane and your families, you guys get to go first. <laughs> 